Hi, folks. Welcome to the future of democracy. Uh, my name is Sam Gill. And in this show, what we try to do is take a look at some of the big ideas, big trends, big controversies that are really animating uh, our democracy, our national conversation, and take you a little deeper than you might be able to get just hearing a debate on cable news or reading one article. And this month, we are teaming up with the Miami Book Fair to host an amazing set of conversations with authors, with artists, focused on different topics about what they think about the future of democracy. And this is all leading up to the 37th annual Miami Book Fair from November 15 to 22nd. The Book Fair is an incredible collection of authors, an incredible collection of books, a really vital conversation about ideas. If you're interested, please go to miamibookfaironline.com uh, or follow them at, at Miami Book Fair. If you're not interested, then you're not paying attention to the incredible authors they're going to have. This year, Natalie Portman, uh, the actress, is going to be a part of the Miami Book Fair. Bill Nye, the science guy, is going to be part of the Miami Book Fair. And you can hear every single presentation, every single talk for free, but only if you tune in from November 15 to 22nd. One of the conversations that we had is with John Murillo. John is a celebrated poet. Uh, he's the author of the collection Up Jump the Boogie and released this year a new collection, Contemporary American Poetry. Uh, I had a chance to sit down with John to talk about his poetry uh, and about what it can tell us uh, with regard to the significant debate we're having in our country about the future of race and racial justice. So I hope you enjoy the conversation. All right. Excellent. Welcome, everyone. And John, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for being uh, Thanks for having me. Well, um, I want to talk, of course, about the work um, that you've just produced, your collection, Contemporary American Poetry. And I was incredibly struck, actually, not by your words, but by the epigraph hmm. from Henry Dumas that you, that you open with. And for our audience, it reads, you're lying, said memory, you're asleep, said forgetfulness. What does this mean to you? Why did you begin the book this way? Yeah, well, the book is, I'd say, quasi-autobiographical, right? And I say that because, you know, over the years, you know, we tell ourselves certain stories about ourselves, right? And we kind of become these characters in our own narrative. Um, and if you do that long enough, you can actually get wrapped up in that and forget what's truth, what's fiction, yeah? So um, the book is somewhat of a buildings Roman. Uh, there are some memoirish qualities to it. Um, but again, you know, this is me writing this, you know, uh, very often 40 odd years after certain events have taken place, 30 years, 20 years. Um, so I know that I'm, you know, creating certain fictions, but I also wanted to give myself that license because it's not autobiographic, uh, autobiography, right? It's, it's poetry. Um, so I'm in that epigraph, I'm giving myself permission to stray and to fictionalize because what's most important for me is not necessarily that I'm um, being factual, but that I'm getting at certain emotional truths, right? So um, if I need to, let's say, um, change a fact around or put the, po the poem in the second person instead of the first, um, because it makes for a more compelling poem, I do that because ultimately that's what I'm after. What, you know, it's, I was, you, something that you just pointed to really struck me in reading some of the poems, which is, which is the power of past and memory that comes out constantly. There are really specific references to years. It's, it's really impressed on the reader that this isn't contemporaneous. In some cases, it's impressed on the reader that there is a perception, there's an interpretation of past sure. that's happening. And I'm thinking about where our country is today, particularly around issues like race. And what you just said really strikes me, which is on the one hand, I feel like we're in a fight for our life to, to be grounded in facts. Absolutely. But we're also in a fight for our life to recover truths that we have avoided through the way that we talk about fact, especially sure. about race. How do you see your work in that moment? It's interesting, right? Um, when we talk about myth-making, Right, especially as a country, we're, we're involved in it all the time. And when we hear slogans like make America great again, uh, you know, you hear people of color, black people often ask the question, when was it great, yeah. right? What is this again you, you're, you're hearkening back to? Um, so I think 
in my work, in this book at least, one thing that I'm trying to do is to um, name names, to put you know, a, a face to certain realities. Um, for instance, a lot of the book has to do with um, police violence against uh, black and brown communities. Um, and it's funny, you know, I, I, I wrote the book, it came out in March. And, you know, soon after a lot of these worldwide protests started taking place. And, you know, people were um, reaching out and telling me how timely the book is. The fact of the matter is the book would have been timely if it came out five <laughs> years ago, right? It would have been exactly. timely 10 years ago. Exactly. So, you know, um, that's another, I don't know if I take that on as uh, a responsibility as a poet, but it is something that I wanted to do with this book as well was to um, document that part of our story and to say, you know, this, this happens. So 10 years from now, 20 years from now, somebody picks up this book and they, you know, hopefully they'll look back and, and say, wow, things were really bad back then. Or conversely, they'll say, wow, things are still as bad as they were in 2020 and in 1992, right? And in dot, dot, dot. What do you, I, so what is the, what is the role of the artist? Is there an obligation of the artist right now in this battle for the soul of our democracy? Would you point out, it's not a new battle. Sure. Maybe it's in a different pitch than it was. Mm -hmm. Do, what should, what should, what is the role of the artist? What should we be calling on artists to help us do? I resist uh, shoulds, if that makes any sense for artists, right? I think artists should create art. If it's in them, if it's in an, in an artist, right, to speak to a certain reality, then they should do so by all means. Um, but I wouldn't put that, uh, that on everyone, right? Um, and, you know, the fact of the matter is, sometimes you need respite, right? So you have your artists who are constantly, constantly um, talking about the reality we live in, but then you also sometimes need uh, a little bit of break from that. So you need um, writers, musicians, filmmakers, painters who can allow you to, to, if not escape, at least get some rest, right? So to my mind, the responsibility of the artist is to create the best art you can, right? Um, and, you know, and let people find it. I do though think that um, it's the responsibility of any and every engaged citizen, right? To, to be thinking about these things, to uh, be doing the fact checking, to, to inform themselves, right? And to, as best they can, inform each other. And you know, everyone has a circle of influence use that, you know, to, to forward the nation. Do you hope that some people who are looking for their voice in their circle of influence will read these poems and mm. see that there are other ways, that there are many ways to participate, to have a voice? I would hope so, I'd hope so. There's a, the historian, John Henry Clark, um, something he would say often, and I take to, he says, do your best work. Right, so whatever your work is, you want to further whatever cause. If you're a shoemaker, make the best shoes you can make for your community. If you're a poet, write the best poems you can write. If you're a, a warrior, right, then that's how you contribute. So um, if nothing else, maybe people will be inspired to get in where they fit in. So I, one of the, I, I wanna talk at some length about the centerpiece of the work, which is this remarkable collection of 15 sonnets, uh, a refusal to mourn the deaths by gunfire of three men in Brooklyn. And for those who haven't yet uh, opened the book, um, it's each sonnet is opened uh, by the words of a black literary figure. So the first question I just want to ask is, how, how did this originate? Yeah, wow. So I want to say it was, I think it was 2017 the year that Ishmael Brinsley, uh, a Baltimore man, took a bus from New York City to, no, 2014, wow. Um, it was 2014, and this was after, uh, I think, Mike Brown. It was after uh, um, uh, Eric, Eric Gardner. Yeah. It was after a few of these murders, right? It's, yeah. it's hard to keep up sometimes. But this guy, he jumped on a bus and had been um, tweeting and Instagramming all day about his plans 
to go to New York City and to kill some police officers. He said for, he wants to take out two of them for every one of us that he that, that they've killed, right? So on this same day, there was a poets rally in Washington Square Park. And I participated. A lot of your, your more well-known poets participated. There are a bunch of us, probably 40 or 50. And we were reading poems in protest of police violence. And I remember it was the coldest day of that year up to that point. So there were hardly anybody there except for poets who were reading poems to each other. And it felt well-meaning, but also impotent, yeah? I remember taking the train home on that day. And I remember that there was an increased police presence. I didn't know why, especially when we got to Brooklyn, some of the Brooklyn platforms, you just noticed, and it just felt weird. So I get home and I find out that while we were in the park making uh, reading poems, this man, Ishmael Brinsley, had taken a bus from Baltimore to Brooklyn, caught two police officers sitting in their car and ambushed them, shot them both dead right there and there. Then he was chased onto a nearby subway platform and then shot himself in the head, uh, murder, double murder suicide. Uh, Sam, I have to tell you, when I first heard about this, my first feeling was one of uh, almost relief, almost, um, I don't know, I, I wouldn't call it happy necessarily, but but I got them right. It's about time, right? It lasted for half a second because then, you know, the 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 more human, humane part of me, you know, kind of jumped in. I was like, no, 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 these are these are human beings. They, as far as you know, didn't do anything. They were on the job sitting there. Not all police officers, uh, right? So, uh, so there was this uh, conflict that, that was um, going on inside of me. So the poem is my attempt. To, do, to kind of sort these feelings out, right? And um, also to give myself a place to, to put the rage, right? Um, we're often taught, and by we, I mean Black people in particular, to always be forgiving. If you look at the way we, uh, we are portrayed in movies, the noble Black character is the character who forgives, yeah. right? Uh, I think the movie, The Butler with Forrest Whitaker, you know, he's treated like crap his whole life, right? And at the end, you know, part of his saving grace is that he forgives everyone who's oppressed him and who's treated him badly, right? This is, um, you know, the thought to be the only way of processing pain, grief, torture, torment, all these things. Um, so when I, what I saw in Ishmael Brinsley, I saw something of a, of, of a hero, right? In, in, in a weird way, when we, th we think of Nat Turner, as someone, you know, who um, we think of him as a hero now, you know, he, he um, started a slave revolt on his plantation. And in doing so, he killed a lot of people. John Brown, we think of him as a hero. Um, but nowadays, there's not even room to even consider that. So the poem wasn't meant necessarily to name Ishmael Brinsley as a hero, but at least to raise the question, right? Um, and like you said, um, it, it goes back and forth in time. Um, it starts off here in, two, in 2014, and I do end up going back to 1992 and, and during the Rodney King rebellions, right, um, and coming forward. Part of what happened, too, while I was writing this poem um, was that I'm, I'm now in a position of being an elder and having students who are also enraged and also trying to figure this out and process this, and being in a position to have to tell them to stand down, to, to not act on, on their rage while I'm also processing my own rage. So a lot I had to get out and, and try to get into the poem. But this is our challenge as a society, right? Like, I, like we're, we're in this debate right now where, for, for example, it's really important, particularly for, uh, for, let's just say, people who see themselves as allied with movements for racial justice mm -hmm. to be really, who have a high profile, to be really clear that they quote, you know, don't condone violence. Sure. It, it's really important to say it. And some of that is, is is rational it's it's not saying it's rational but some of that is our inability to somehow acknowledge the righteousness of rage because mm -hmm. we don't we don't want to embrace all of its expressions and sure. i hear you saying and i see it in your poems is we have to find a place for the rage like if we only have a place for the, the divinity of grace mm -hmm. then then we consign ourselves to injustice so help us through this like how do we 
is art the place? Is art the place that we find a place for rage? Like, did you did you find something in writing this that helped you to figure out that conflict inside of you? Um, it helped me to, I don't know. I won't say a word through it all the way because you know it's something that's ongoing, right? Writing a poem isn't going to writing a poem about uh, murders that occurred in 2014 don't absolve anything from 2020, right? So um, on the one hand, and I think I addressed this in one of the sections of the poem, there is also the sense of, of having um, done nothing of consequence, right? Um, and and I, what I feel is necessary is to at least acknowledge that, right? So if we're going to talk about the history um, and what it brings into people, you have to talk about the rage, right? Um, I think um, our best writers and best thinkers, I'm thinking about Baldwin, who, talked about the, the fire that was coming next time, right? Or you talked about, or you hear about Mike, Malcolm X talking about um, how America was a powder keg, ready to blow at any moment, right? Um, you need people to tell you these things, right? Um, because otherwise you see what's happening. Yeah. You see what's happening all around. Um, but this, you know, this is what happens. This is what happens. You, you know, you, they keep killing, they keep killing. And we march around, you know, I'll tell you what, I'm looking, thinking back when Prince Jones Jr. was killed by a Maryland police officer. And I think this was in the early 2000s. Ta-Nehisi Coast writes about this in uh, Between the World and Me. And I remember that protest. I was at Howard University at the time. And I remember we marched uh, to the Department of Justice and we circled the building. Al Sharpton was there and he says, we're gonna circle the building seven times and like Jericho, the walls are gonna fall down and da da da. And I remember about the third or fourth time around the building, I started thinking, like, this is stupid. <laughs> this is dumb, you know, like these walls are gonna fall. They had a very prescribed path that we could walk, right? They had um, officers lined up in the riot gear in case anything went down. We marched around the building for a few times and then we went home, you know? And it didn't seem like it changed anything. So um, I think that uh, the rage needs to be acknowledged as a reality, you know, yeah. and, and that, you know, something just happened in, in California very recently, very similar to the Ishmael Brinsley shootings, right? I don't condone it at all, um, but I'm, I am naming it and saying, look, you know, the, the people, are, people are fed up. People are fed up. I, I agree with that. I mean, I, again, I, what I found really powerful about the, the book was that I don't, we're we're not we're not going to get there by foisting the obligation of grace, and I think we're not going to get there by also allowing those who are afraid of a changing world to have a monopoly on rage. Sure. And sure. and that and that does work. That that I found hope in your in your poems because I found something in between somehow saying a caricatured idea of violence is okay or not that says sure. rage. We that that we that there is real rage. And until we address the causes, the reasonable, the rage is righteous. The rage mm -hmm. is as divine as the grace. And until we recognize that, um, we're not recognizing anything behind the strength of our, the strength of our words or our sentiments of, of solidarity. I, that's where I found hope. Is it, sure. is it, where do you find hope? Do you find hope anywhere? <sighs> do I find hope? I don't know. I feel that um, no, I, I'm, I'm thinking about a James Baldwin interview when he's asked the very same question, and I'm trying not to parrot his words exactly, um, as if I ever could. But he says something to the to the effect that we can't help but be hopeful, right? I mean, what's the alternative, yeah. right? Um, pessimism isn't isn't really an alternative, you know. Um, in order to keep going, you need something to hold on to. You need to believe that things will get better. And I do, I think that if you take the long view, right, this is just a moment, right? Even what I'm talking about, even when we're talking about um, police brutality, for instance, it's something that has a long history, but not as long as, as we've been here as human beings, right? So, you know, it is something that I do think we can work over to. And I'll tell you this, I don't know that anything in, in the book or in writing the poems has given me hope, but I do know that all the protests I've seen this year, international and the scope, I've never seen anything like this before, right? That gives me hope. Um, my students uh, who are um, 
some of the brightest young minds I've come across ever. And the work that they're doing and the way that they're processing a lot of this, that gives me hope. I think they're gonna be doing a lot better than we were able to do, our generation, or even the generations before us. Uh, yeah, so, so, you know, the young people give me hope. Uh, the spirit that all over the, the, the world, people are saying this isn't right and we're fed up, that gives me hope. So I, I, another question I want to ask you about what inspires your art is I, I, was, I was also struck in, in a refusal to death to more, a refusal to mourn the deaths by gunfire of three men in Brooklyn, the way this archaeology of, of phenomenal black literary figures, some of whom are well known, some of whom are less well known, that motivates uh, the the poem. I I call it archaeology, but I just there was this incredible recovery to me of these voices. Um, what tell tell us about why that was important to the work? Yeah. Well. Again, um, George Floyd's experience was his experience, but it was also, in many ways, all of our experiences, right? Um, the rage of Ishmael Brinsley was a rage that we all feel. So it's a collective experience. I wanted the, the poem to feel like a collective endeavor. So I wanted to bring in other voices, in, in, you know, in addition to my own. Um, and I wanted to bring in the voices of um, black male writers because um, at the time of, of writing the poem, you know, that was where, you know, I saw a lot of the, um, uh, a lot of the violence being committed against us, right? So I wanted to give them a say, if you will. And uh, it was a chorus. And, and I like the way you say this archeology, span you know, as, as a, you know, I was, I was digging up because you know, a lot of the poets were dead. And in that sense, I felt like I had um, not just my own voice in poems or, or, or my own strength, but the strength of all those that came before me and stand beside me, right? Ancestors and contemporaries helping me to write this poem. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, I think and it, it's one of the reasons it really moved me is it goes back to this rage conversation. You know, part of, part of meeting this righteous rage where it is, is the work that we're doing to talk about, to name grievous wrong in sin in our history, so to speak. Mm -hmm. But I also, what I loved about it is this is, this is the affirmative rage, right? This is, sure. these are the people explaining to us where to go, what to do, how to feel, how they feel. Yes. And, and they're, and the voices are vital. To some extent they're vital, as you noted, because the world hasn't changed in ways that it needs to, but in other ways they're vital because they're speaking to these timeless these timeless dilemmas that we have to confront uh, as a society. Is there, of the, of, the, of the voices that you've made a part of this collective effort, who is, could, is there someone that all of us should read, you know, in 2020? Mm -hmm. is, there, is, there, is there an overlooked, we, we obviously we need to read Baldwin, you know, but is there yeah, someone else yeah. that you think is maybe underrated who every American who sees themselves as part of a more just future should go back to? I mean, well, that's a huge question, but also it's a huge responsibility, right? I don't think that a, a single voice can really, really do any of this justice, you know? I'm a media um, hack. I have to ask these questions. <laughs> no, I hear you. I hear you. Um, but but I, don't, I don't think so. I think, um, you know, a lot of the poets, you know, there, you know, you have your Robert Hayden, Gil Scott Heron, Tim Siebel, Terrence Hayes, Reginald Dwayne Betts is in there. Um, and then there are also others that, that were, were not present. You know, I'm thinking about uh, Nicole Seeley, who, who was my wife, but also is a great poet and who uh, writes about matters of race as well. Yeah. I'm thinking about um, Tyler Johnson. I'm thinking about um, Cameron Aquad Rich. You know, so there are Araceli Skirmai, Martina Spada. You know, so there, there are a lot of poets out here doing the work. Natalie Diaz, right? Um, and and it's, it's, I think, a testament to the moment we don't have a singular voice in the same way, you know. Um, some might, um, I think Toni Morrison, before she passed, named ta Coates as possibly the James Baldwin of this generation. I don't know that we have one. I think yeah. there are, you know, the, the responsibility spread out, which, um, I don't know, I think it's a good thing. Yeah, well, I, you brought that home, right? I mean, there's, in uh, the past doesn't just have James Baldwin. The past has all of these voices, yes, all of these yes. voices that we can be using today. Yes. Um, 
so I have to ask one more hacky question. Uh, uh, but I can't help, given the silly season we're in, if you could ask the presidential candidates to read one of the poems in this book, which one would it be and why? Oh, wow. Wow. <laughs> I'd probably ask Donald Trump to read one of the sonnets because they're shortest and it'd be easiest on him. <laughs> um, <laughs> and um, that, that's a great question. Uh, I might have them both read the centerpiece, the, 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 the sonnet sequence. Um, not that, you know, Trump would be very interested in this. I feel, at this point, I really do feel that ignorance is willful, yeah? Um, and I just, yeah, I don't even, I wouldn't even waste my time uh, with him, but I think, you know, for Biden, let's say, yeah, yeah, read, read the centerpiece, you know? I think it shows um, maybe a, a ground level view of, of everything that's happening out there, and that or that leads up to what's happening out there on, on, on the streets. Right. It's the, if, it's the poem, if you want your understanding to match your words. Yes. That's, the, that's what to read. I, Absolutely. I love that. Yes. Well, the, 70, uh, the 37th Annual Miami Book Fair will run from November 15 to 22nd. All the readings, presentations, and conversations will be online and free, but only available from November 15 to 22nd. Voices include, in addition to John Murillo, Walter Mosley, Ilsa Calderon, Bill Nye the Science Guy, Abby Wambuck, Natalie Portman. You can visit MiamiBookFairOnline.com or at Miami Book Fair on Twitter. This show, Future of Democracy from Knight Foundation, airs live Thursdays at 1. Every episode is available at kf.org slash fdshow or on Spotify, Apple, or wherever you find your podcasts. And any one of these special episodes that we're recording now will also be available on the website or where you go for your podcasts. Uh, and you can follow me on Twitter at the Sam Gill. The author is John Murillo. The book is Contemporary American Poetry. You can find him at johnmurillo.com. John, thank you so much for joining us. Hey, man, thank you. This is great.